John chapter 6, verse 44. But for the, for the context, I will start reading from 35. 35 up to 47. This is the word of God, and God is speaking directly to us. It's not man's word. It's not my word. And it's a, this is the time where where this is the, the peak, the peak time in our week. So I read, let us listen humbly. John chapter 6, starting verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing for all that he has given me. But raised it up on the last day. For this is my will of my Father. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is it not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. This is our text. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Full stop. And I will raise him up on the last day, which is written in the prophets. And they will be taught by God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you to learn from your word. You are the author of this word and we acknowledge that we're not above this word. We are below this word. We are not authoritative over this word, but you are authoritative of, over us through your word. And we submit ourselves under your word. Lord, teach us. Teach us, correct us, rebuke us, encourage us through your word. Lord, glorify Christ in this preaching and humble us. Lord, save people from by this preaching. Enlighten people by this preaching. But I have no power to, to do that, to bring people to Christ. It's only your power. Lord, save us. In Jesus' name. Amen. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Let me ask you this question. How did you come to faith in Christ? How did you become Christian? Why did you and I trust Christ while others did not? It is because we are more logical or they are not or are we Foolish for being convinced by the preacher, while they are wise for not to be convinced. What is the reason behind our salvation? The expression, come to Christ, is common in the scripture. Jesus used that, come to me. Spurgeon precisely explained, coming to Christ is used to express those acts of the soul where in living at once our righteousness, our self-righteousness and our sin 
We flee unto the Lord and receive his righteousness to be our covering and his blood to be our atonement. Coming to Christ, embrace repentance towards God and face towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's coming to Christ. You might often hear the expression in church, coming to Christ, in church service, and even on the street. Come to Christ, right? When I ask people in my membership interviews and or informal conversations how they came to Christ, some say, I came to Christ when the preacher gave an altar call at the end of the service and I went to the front and gave my life to Jesus by praying the sinner's prayer. And they say, then I became Christian. Adam might say, I, I did not come to the front of the church, but I prayed a sinner's prayer in my bedroom. And I became a Christian. This expression, come to Christ, is, is surrounded by much ignorance and confusion. Especially when it is tied to wrong evangelistic method. It does not, what does this expression mean to its hearer? Yes, it is necessary for sinners to come to Christ to be saved. Yes, that's biblical. But when a preacher calls sinner to the front of the church, when the congregation setting the mood through silence and calm instrument, an invitational song that manipulates emotion, people began to equate coming to Christ with coming forward or walking the aisles. When the preacher say, Come, come to Christ at the end of the service, many interpret it as coming to front to the church. What do our children th think it means when the preacher say, Come to Christ? And at the same time, invite them in front of the church? What are we convincing ourselves and others of when we teach and practice such things in church, even on the streets? We, the church, is teaching to equate or make the same coming to Christ with a physical act of coming forward. We are reducing coming to Christ to purely mental, purely emotional, purely physical act, which is not biblical. This practice was never practiced by our Lord Jesus Christ or the apostles. It was not even practice in the Christian church until Charles Finney introduced it in 8030. Although even he did not equate the physical act with the spiritual reality to come to Christ. Yet in the modern Christian, in our church, in our personal conviction, we believe and teach and practice that coming to Christ is purely mental, purely emotional, purely physical. But this approach, listen, this approach fabricates and produces men and women who are outwardly religious, who can pray, who can sing, who can talk and act like Christians, but are spiritually dead in their trespasses and sin. Still unconverted men and women, still totally depraved, still slave to sin, still men and women without Christ. Why, why am, am I so concerned about this subject? Because many people are deceived and to be deceived about their own salvation and this is the worst deception that can come upon any human being, leading them to Christless eternity and to be rejected by Christ himself and he his terrifying word on the last day, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. As your brother in Christ, 
It is my boast, it's both my duty and desire for you to understand, for me to understand that coming to Christ must be rooted in Scripture. Not merely in our culture, church tradition or culture or emotional experience. My heart ache for those who believe they are saved because of a physical act or emotional response, yet lack saving faith in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that each one of us leave this morning, this place completely saved and assured of our salvation. Ready to hear the comforting word of our Lord Jesus Christ on that day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Rather than the terrifying words of rejection. Let me ask you one more time. How did you come to faith in Christ? How does a person truly become a believer or Christian? Remember, remember the gospel message, the saving work of Christ is to be proclaimed to all people. Yes, without exception. It is the means through which reconciliation with God is offered to everyone. Jesus said, whoever believes in me is invited to partake in the gift of salvation. The goal, the gospel call knows bound, knows no bound. It's for everyone the gospel call. Yes, despite the universal offer, the Bible reveals two distinct groups, those who believe and those who do not. It's clear. This division raises an important question for us. Why do some believe while others do not? What makes the general call of the gospel effectual for some but not for others? The answer lies in this text and theologically in the doctrine of regeneration. The doctrine of regeneration. If you already preach my text, what I already said, there is a way. I wish you just continue to preach. But it lies on the doctrine of regeneration. You, you might hear me or any place when you read, or Josh or uh, Michael, when, you, when, when we say the doctrine of regeneration, person must be regenerated. And this is, this is the meaning. Regeneration is the sovereign and miraculous work of this Holy Spirit that creates a new heart in the sinners, which desires and responds to the gospel with faith and repentance. I will read it again. Regeneration is the sovereign and miraculous work of the Holy Spirit that creates a new heart in sinners, which desires and responds to the gospel with faith and repentance. You might think that coming to Christ is the easiest thing in the world. But our text shows that it is completely impossible for anyone unless the Father draws them to Christ. As we explore this text, it may be challenging or even offensive to some of you due to your heart's inclination. However, even if the process is painful or confronting, the outcome is far better than the discomfort. So be patient as you take this step of humility before God when we expound this text, this one verse. So this morning I will highlight two key observations from the text. Two observations. If you take a note, I think it will be displayed. The first point is man's utter inability to come to Christ. Man's utter inability to come to Christ. The second one is God's miraculous work in bringing man to Christ. Man's, God's miraculous work in bringing man to Christ. So let us begin with the first, begin with the first point. Man's 
utter inability to come to Christ. We find our Lord Jesus Christ saying, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Unless God do something first in man's heart, no man can come to faith in Christ. But where does this inability lie? Where does he say, no man, no man, where does this inability lie? First, coming to Christ does not depend on our physical limitation or ability. If simply moving up your body and walk, walking could help you to come to Christ, then anyone who was leg could easily make the move, just as easily as going anywhere else. If coming to Christ involved saying a prayer, no physical inability. Saying a prayer, there is no physical barrier. There is there anyone who can speak, who can pray just as easily as they can curse. Anyone can sing biblical songs like us just as easily as they can sing a blasphemous songs. There is no lack of physical ability when it comes to Christ, coming to Christ any part of salvation that depends on physical strength is entirely within human capability without needing any help from the Holy Spirit. Nor is the ability to come to Christ due to lack of our mental ability. Believing the Bible is just as easy as believing any other book. If believing in Christ it's just a mental process that we can believe in him just like we believe in anyone else. If something is true, it does not make sense to say we cannot believe it. Our mind can understand the truth about sin and God just as well as they understand other serious things. We have the mental strength needed to think about seeking God or personal good. Even if someone is not very knowledgeable, they cannot use that as an excuse for not accepting the gospel. So what is, what is man's problem? What is the problem of man's inability to come to Christ? The real problem is not with our bodies or mind's ability, but with the utter moral corruption of our being which affect our ability to perceive and to respond to moral and spiritual truths it lies deeply in man's nature remember we are by nature children of wrath through the fall adam fall and through our own sin, the nature of man had, has become so debased, so depraved and corrupted that it is impossible for him to come to Christ without the work of God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible does not teach us that man is just sick or weak. But rather, dead in the trespasses and sins. Dead. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Dead. The unbelievers are no more able to come to Christ than a dead man is able to rise and walk. There is no life in and of themselves. They are totally spiritually dead. Dead is dead. Dead is not weak. Dead is not sick. Dead is dead. And we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Do you see what the text says? No man can. The phrase no man is all inclusive. All inclusive. Rich, poor, young, old, baby, old. All inclusive. Whoever a person may be, he is unable and do not come 
and almighty power and drawing is necessary in order for anyone to come to Christ. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subjected to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 7. He cannot come to the Lord. He cannot believe Christ. Only God can move him to this state. Whether we like it or not, the natural man is dead. Dead spiritually and must be born again. He must be brought to life to have come to Christ and must be awakened by the Spirit to see the sinfulness of his sin and the beauty of Christ. He has neither knowledge nor faith nor heart inclination towards Christ until grace comes into the heart of that man. Dead in their trespasses and sins. And by nature is corrupt corruptible that he cannot respond to Christ and his saving work speaking of man's nature Charles Spurgeon gave this example so beautiful example imagine a sheep he said imagine a sheep that loves to eat grass it is not interested in anything else like meat now consider a wolf you might ask if a wolf could eat grass and follow a shepherd like a sheep does? The answer is yes. No. No. Because a wolf's nature is different from a sheep. Even though a wolf has ears, legs, it won't naturally follow a shepherd or live on a grass. It's a paycheck. It's his nature. And it is the same with us. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to do evil. By nature, we are children of wrath. We like sin. We are sinners. We are dead. We are blind. Coming to Christ is so contrary to human nature that even though people have the physical and mental ability to come to Christ, they simply won't do it unless God the Father draws them. Some of you might say, what about free will? People can be saved if they want to. But there is a free will. Yes, we agree. We agree, but the issue is that people do not want to be saved. People often misunderstood the concept of free will. They say, I believe people can be saved if they chose to, chose to. But that's not really the question. The real question is whether people are naturally willing to accept the humbling term of the gospel. They are not the natural man is utterly submerged in the mud of pride. But so you say, what about my experience, Amani? My experience. And I'm saved. I came to Christ by myself and by my own free will. But I say to you, you are not right upon scriptural authority. You are not above this authority, this Bible. Before the Spirit changed our heart, you and I were desperately sick, desperately, spiritually, totally dead, utterly depraved and inclined to things, everything that is evil. God did not complete 99% of your salvation and leave final 1% to us. In truth, speak, if you speak just to contribute something in your salvation, the only thing we contribute to our salvation is our sin. That's all. Our sin is the only contribution. Jesus insisted in John 8, 34, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Augustine echoes 
I quote this saying, free will without grace has the power to do nothing but sin. He also stated, you can call the wheel free, but in fact, it is an enslaved sin, an enslaved wheel. The natural man is incapable of exercising his free will to transform himself, believe the gospel, to repent from his sin. He is utterly unable. He is utterly cannot come to Christ. He is dead. He is an enemy to God. Not only our will is utterly corrupted to come to Christ, but the understanding is also darkened. Our understanding. The human mind is so clouded that it is not, it cannot grasp the things of God until the Holy Spirit opens it. We cannot understand. We are darkened. We are blind. Do you remember Lydia? That wealthy woman. In the book of Acts chapter 16, it says, Paul is speaking. He is proclaiming. And it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. He opened her heart even to listen, to pay attention, to understand it. After that, she got saved. By nature, we are spiritually blind. The cross of Christ full of glory and beauty does not attract us because we are unable to see its glory and beauty. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory, the gospel of the glory of Christ. The natural man cannot Do not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. As long as someone remains in their natural state, they are enabled of grasping the things of God in an intimate, personal, and saving way. We are living in a day of many false conversion. Precisely because people have been persuaded to call themselves Christian without having understood the gospel. Because people learn it in an attempt. Because people are learned it in an attempt. Because people say that the sinner's prayer. Our churches are currently producing millions of dead men and women who assume they are Christian but are running to eternal hell. The reason that the reason is that the church does not believe how serious sin and its effect is. Effect is the understanding is darkened. We don't know how sin is deceitful. We don't know how sin is very hard. Man cannot understand the things of God unless the Spirit enlightens his understanding. No one can come because he is blind. No one will and understand, not only our will and understanding are utterly corrupted, but also our affection. Our affection before experiencing God's grace. People naturally love anything and everything more than spiritual things. We can see this everywhere. Look just around. The evidence of this truth is all around us. In every street. In our houses. In our hearts. In our churches. In our private lives. We love what we should hate. And we hate what we should love. 
the natural man prefer, prefer this life over the life to come. Love the darkness more than the light. Love sin more than righteousness and chooses the way of the world over the ways of God. Until God does something in our hearts, it is impossible for anyone to come to Christ, to be affected by Christ and to love Christ. It is impossible. But just there upon there one person, it is impossible. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Before, before I go to the next point, let me tell you the two stories from church history. Two stories. Their, their, their life and conversion. And the first person is Augustine of Hippo. And the second one is John Wesley. Let me start by Augustine. Augustine of Hippo. Lives in, lived from 3054 up to 4030 AD. And he is one of the most influential theologians in Christian history. Born to a Christian mother and a pagan father in modern day Algeria. He had a basic understanding of Christianity because of his mother, but pursued a life far from in its use, his use. Despite being intellectually gifted and passionate about rhetoric and philosophy, Augustine indulged in worldly pleasure, including intense sexual immorality. He was spiritually restless, consistently searching for truth, but finding no peace. In 384 AD, he, he went to Milan. After he grew up, he went to Milan to teach rhetoric. There he encountered Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, who preaching, whose preaching captivated him. Initially drawn by, by Ambrose's or, or rhetorical skill rather than a genuine desire for God. Augustine's world view was gradually challenged by Ambrose's exposition of scripture, leading to increased inner turmoil. He was torn between his desire to surrender to God and his deep attachment to the worldly pleasure. A struggle he vividly described in his book, Confession, quote, end quote. I long for the impurity which I had so much loved and desired. My imagination was filled with it. I was chained by the love of woman. I was enslaved to lust in its form of indulgence. And the habit was deep rooted in me. I found it difficult to think of anything else or to dream of anything else. I was bound, not by iron, imposed by anyone else, but by the iron of my own will, totally depraved. The enemy held my will in his power, and from it he had forged a chain for me and bound me with it. For out of the perverse will come lust. And the service of lust ended in habit, and habit not resisted become, became necessity. Augustine's heart was divided, and he knew that only God could deliver him from his bondage to sin. He cannot. One day, while he was in a garden with his friend, Augustine was overwhelmed by the weight of his sin and his inability to change himself. He was drawn to a private spot under a fig tree where he wept bitterly. As he wept, Augustine heard a child voice singing, tole lege, tole lege, which means take up and read, take up and read. He interpreted this as a divine command and he picked up a new Bible and opened it randomly. His eyes fell on Romans 13 verse 11 up to 14. And it says, Beside this you know the time that the hour has come to you to wake, to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than we were first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the work of darkness 
and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as the daytime, as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, nor not in quarrel, quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for flesh to gratify its desire. He read this. At that moment, the Holy Spirit worked in him. Augustine's heart, awaken him to the truth, the word of scripture, pierced his soul, the light of God's truth, flooded his mind, and he surrendered himself to God. Augustine later described this moment of his spiritual awakening in honest stance. He said, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. This marked the beginning of Augustine's life pursuit of God. Reflecting on his conversion, he wrote this. It's so beautiful how he expressed it. Late have I loved you, O beauty ever enchant, ever new. Late have I loved you. You called, you shouted, you broke through my deafness, you flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breath and fragrance, your fragrance on, my, on me, I drew in breath. And now I pant for you. I have tested you. Now I hunger and thirst for more. You touch me and I pine it for your peace. This is Augustine's conversion. You called, you shouted. You flashed, you shone in my blindness. The other person is John Wesley. He was a remarkable figure in church history known for his role in the Methodist movement. Wesley was raised in devout Anglican family. Like, like most of us, we grew up in a Christian family and became a missionary and became a, a missionary to an American colony. However, his effort in Georgia, where he went to the missionary place, his effort in Georgia were largely unsuccessful leaving him feeling defeated and questioning his faith. In his journal, he wrote, he was missionary, assume this, he was missionary. I went to America to convert the Indian, but oh, who shall convert me? Who, what is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of unbelief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well now, and I believe myself. While no danger is near, but late days look me in the face, and my spirit is troubled. Nor I can say to die is gain. On May 24, 1733, Wells, Wesley reluctantly, he was a missionary. He assumed he's a Christian, like most of us. Most of the evangelical churches. Wesley reluctantly attend a meeting on Alders Gate Street where some someone read from Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle of the Romans. As Wesley listened, he experienced something new in his soul, and he later described the moment like this quote end quote. About a quarter before a nine while he was describing the change which God worked in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Whew. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given to me. He had taken my, away my sin, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This person is soon a Christian. He is a missionary and he got saved by the work of God my question for all of us this morning is how did this man come to Christ one was deeply entangled in worldly pleasure and the other was devout religious even a missionary man how did God bring them to Christ 
take a moment and reflect and ask yourself again, how did I come to faith in Christ? What brought me to become a Christian? The answer is found in the same verse. Coming to Christ is a supernatural work that relies solely on God's power. Look at the verse again. No one can come to me. No one can come to me, Jesus said. This is the verse. Unless, it's unless, unless the Father who sent me draws him. Salvation depends entirely on the inward work of God's sovereign, miraculous power, creating new hearts in the believers and, and sinners that desire and respond to the gospel with faith and repentance. This change of heart leads sinners to come to Christ with delight. God must act first before man act. God must initiate with man before man can respond to God. And this brings us our, to our second point. God's miraculous work in bringing man to Christ. No one can come to me. No one. Unless the Father who sent me draws him. How does then God draws man to Christ? That's the question. How? We already answered a little bit, but let's go deep. Many believe, many people believe God draw men through the preaching of the word, the word of God, the preaching of the gospel. We are given the commission as the people of God, as the church, to proclaim the gospel to every person, to the whole world. We know that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Romans 10. That's why we, our church sent Ryan to preach the gospel. Yes. That's how God saved people by the preaching of the gospel. Yes. We believe. Our church believe. I believe. And the Bible commands me to do that. We must proclaim the gospel, and it's true. We agree that preaching of the gospel is the tool for drawing people, but not everyone. The problem is not everyone who hears the gospel responds to it. There must be something more than preaching. There must be something more than this word. There must be something. According to verse 24, in John chapter 6, Christ is addressing the people of Capernaum. You can read in Matthew 11 how he preached there. Where he had frequently preached and shared the woes of the law and the invitation of the gospel. In that city, he performed many mighty miracles and works. In fact, he said that Tyre and Sidon would have repented long ago in sad clothes and ashes if they had witnessed such miracle. They were stubborn. If Christ's own preaching and miracle did not enable these people to come to him, it cannot be that the drawing of the Father is simply through preaching. It is not. No brothers and sister, note that he does not say in this verse, no one can come to me unless the preacher or the preaching draws him. But unless the father draws him. It is impossible to draw by the preaching of the gospel unless the father draw men to Christ first. The word, the word draw in this verse is the same word that it is used in the book of Acts. When some men, in Acts 60, when some men in Philippi dragged Paul and Silas before the authority of casting out evil spirit out of their slave girl, those men did not try to convince them, come, come to the authority, come. No. 
They compelled them. They dragged them. Oh, you do not stand at the top of the wall and call the water to, to come to you. Rather, you do. You lower your bucket and you draw the water. His point is that people cannot come to him unless they are compelled to come by the Father. Unless God drags them. Unless God drags you and me. You are dead. You might ask me, so Amani, are you saying that God dragged them against their will? Is God rude? Are you saying that God will force men to come to Christ? Like this, this uh, the Acts 16, how they drag Paul and Silas? Are you saying that God will drag by force to come to Christ. But so how does how does the God draw people? How does God draw people? Simple by making them willing. By making them willing, by directly influence the heart. He goes to the deepest part of a person's being and changes their will. God draw men and women to Christ by gra gracious change their heart, changing their heart, setting them free from the bondage of sin. God, through His Spirit, give them a new birth to see the kingdom of God. You, you can open it, but let's, let, let me read it for you. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. It says, it's a, oh, the new covenant. He said, Oh, and I will give a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of a flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my status, in my status and be careful to obey my rules. What A.B. already told us. God is the one who circumcises our hearts. God is the one who do some miracles in our hearts. He made a surgery in our hearts. There's a stony heart who is stubborn to, to come to Christ, to obey for his saviorship and lordship. He, 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 he put it out. He took it and put in our hearts fleshy heart that beats for him, that obeys him. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you cannot see the kingdom, you cannot see the Savior. You cannot see the kingdom. You must be born again. That's why we believe regeneration, work of the Spirit, precede and produce faith. You cannot have faith unless you are born again. You cannot come to Christ unless God, the Spirit of God, God the Spirit works in your heart and made you alive. You cannot. Remember our, our salvation is not solely the work of the Spirit, but rather the work of the three person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But the Father is the initiator of our salvation. Before eternity, Ephesians 1, in love, He planned to save sinners and sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. As the Father planned, the Son humbled Himself. Becoming man like us, born of a woman and under the law, to redeem those under the law, me and you, so that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. He lived a righteous life on earth, took our sins and punishment upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, died on the cross. And he said, it's finished. 
and rose from the dead on the third day for our justification, making us righteous before the Holy God. And then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who applies the work of the Father and the Son in the heart of unregenerated people in an effective way, the dead heart. He worked them, enabling them to come to Christ willingly and delightfully and joyfully. The first thing that the Holy Spirit does is confront a person who has a high opinion of themselves. He will confront them. Nothing to stop someone from coming to Christ more than thinking too highly of themselves. Prideful. Pride. But the Holy Spirit reveals the true state of our heart, their heart, showing them the deep corruption within, like a hidden cancer eating away at their life. And the Holy Spirit shows them that they cannot fix on their own, stripping away the sense of power and strength that leads to them to despair and cry out, Oh, save me. Oh, save me. I cannot. I can never be saved. Nothing can save me. Then the Holy Spirit shows the sinners, us, the cross of Christ. Give him an eye to see the beauty and say, say for our hearts, look at the cross of Christ. And the sinner says, I feel, I feel I'm a sinner. And the Holy Spirit says to his heart, that man on the cross died for you sins. The Spirit enables the heart, to, the heart to believe and come to Christ. When the hearts come to Christ with their Spirit's gentle drawing, find a peace with God which surpasses all understanding, guarding their hearts and minds through Jesus our Lord. Now, you can see clearly that all this happened without any force. The person come to Christ just as willing as if they were not being drawn at all. It's mysterious. It's a miracle. They come with full agreement. As if they were not hidden. There were no hidden influence at work in their heart. Yet this divine work is essential. Because without it, no one would or could come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why many, many Christians, when you ask them about their conversion, they say, I believe. Yes, I believe. I came to Christ. I trust Christ. Without realizing that the Lord worked something sovereign and miraculous in their heart, enabling them to desire first. And to respond to the gospel with faith and repentance. And now let us gather our thoughts. And let me try to apply this marvelous doctrine. The doctrine of regeneration. Practically and hopefully comforting you. If, if what I preach is truly... Biblical, this glorious doctrine of regeneration is in the Bible. That means for some of you here that you must give it all up and start over. My dear friends, it would be a blessing for me and for my church to see that. It's a joy if you did that. If you believe that you can save yourself and keep yourself safe, remember what you're doing is building your house on the sand. Let me tell you, if your face is built on your strengths, it won't stand before the Holy God on that final day. It cannot stand. Only what comes from eternity, last to eternity, and stand on the eternal, before eternal God. The spiritual heaven should be filled with spiritual people. 
my friends, it is pointless. It's pointless to depend on your church attendance, your singing, your prayer, or being honest or respectable if you hope to be saved by them, by these things. Continue in these good works, but do not trust in them, for they will fail you when you, when you need them most. Because you're building on the sand. You cannot stand. And only the Spirit of God can prepare us to that, to that day, to stand before the Holy God. You might think that you can repent and believe the gospel whenever you chose. You were convinced by the false understanding what you learned before or what you experienced, but I took that hope from you and terrified you. Huh. If that's the case, I am glad. I'm glad. And this is the effect I hope to produce in you as your brother in Christ. I pray you feel this even more when you lose hope for saving yourself. I have hope that God has begun to save you. If you say from the heart, I cannot come to Christ, O Lord, draw me. Draw me to you. Help me. If you say, draw me. After you will let us run together. I will rejoice over you. The church will rejoice over you. Anyone who desires to come to Christ. Even if you lack power. Grace is working in your heart. And God will not abandon you until the work is finished. But for the careless sinners. Listen carefully. You sinners. Those who reject Christ. Those who reject the living water. Those who reject the bread of life. Know that your salvation is in God's hand. It's not in your hands. Remember you are entirely in God's hand. You have sinned against Him. And if He chose to condemn you, then you are indeed condemned. You cannot resist his will or his purpose or his power. You deserve his wrath if he chose to pour it out on you right now as you sit. Right now. You cannot stop it. But if he chose to save you, he can save you. He can save you completely. He is the God you offend daily. He is the God who is angry at you. Does it, does, does it not make you to tremble that you, 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 your eternal destiny is in the hand of the one you have offended and hungered? Does this not make you terrified and make, make you say, Oh, oh, save the wretched sinner? If it does, the church rejoice with me. For this may be the first sign of the Spirit's work in your heart, in your soul. Tremble and kiss the Son, and lest they be angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Come to Christ. Trust in the name of Christ now as you sit. Some of you this morning are aware of that you're coming to Christ. Have you not begun to weep with repentance? Do you not, don't you, didn't you pray in the service as I preach? Now have your heart cried out this old hymn, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, O Savior, or I die. 
Have you not said in your heart, Jesus, my whole trust is in you? I know that my own righteousness cannot save me, but only, oh, Christ, I cast myself on you, on your blood. Oh, my brothers and sisters, you are drawn by the Father. For you could not have come to Christ unless he draws you. The final group I wish to address is those who believe in Christ. Including myself. How can I know if I am truly regenerated? How can I know that I am truly born again? This question may be in your mind, rattling. The answer is straightforward and simple. Jesus doesn't make this complicated for us. Have you turned it from sin, your sin, and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? That's simple. As the scripture says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Whoo! Those who the Father has given to Jesus are those who have turned from their sin and trust in the only Savior and Lord, Christ Jesus. And Jesus assured us in verse 37 of this chapter, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Therefore, for those who trust in Christ, your beloved, as your Savior and Lord, the glorious doctrine of regeneration should cause your heart to leap with joy. Be joyful and produce assurance in your heart the God who has drawn you to Christ and give you Him as mightier than all, than yourself, than the struggle, than the trials, than the hardship, than your boyfriend, everything. He's mightier than you. No one can snatch you from the Father's hand until you stand before His glory face to face until you see that. You're assured. You're kept by His power. Rejoice in this truth and let it secure your soul for you are held fast by the eternal power of God.